Welcome everyone to episode 14 of the FarmEd uh, podcast series. Uh, my name's Ed, I'm the program coordinator and this is the first podcast that I'll be doing um, with the team. And today we're joined by Niels Caulfield, uh, agroecological advisor, trainer, consultant, soil specialist, and perhaps many other titles to go with it. Um, so welcome Niels. Hi. Um, today we're gonna talk a lot about uh, soil, particularly soil health. Um, and I know that that is really kind of fundamentally what a lot of your work is all about. Um, but for some listeners who are maybe tuning in not from a farming background, could you tell them why you think regenerating farms from a, from a soil perspective and, and indeed landscapes is so important? Um, yeah, well, I think in a nutshell, we should think of it as if our lives depend on it because, you know, in... in um, uh, kind of an object in an objective sense, basically, we are wedded to the landscape. Um, you know, the land feeds us, um, and we need to care for it and steward it because otherwise, it ain't going to be there tomorrow, basically. Um, but I guess, in sort of like more kind of immediate terms, I think the important thing really is that, like, um, well, I guess from for, for, from a practitioner's point of view is that you know the better heart the land is in basically um, um, the easier it is to manage you know the less liable plants and crops are to fail or to get diseases for example um, the healthier the stock will be um, and the less uh, risk there is from a production point of view basically um, you know those virgin lands that the that the settlers moved into in the Midwest, you know, they were a bounty um, and they're not anymore. And that's because of our management, basically. Um, so it's about understanding, I think, well, I think there's two things. One is sort of a bit of a bad news story, if you like, kind of we have mismanaged um, soils and ecosystem systems in the past. And that has led to sort of a number of um, issues, like economic issues, for example, that are basically a product of ecological decline. Um, and also there's a good news story in that, that it means that that is sort of within our grasp, basically. Uh, it is within the can of man, basically, to uh, restore, regenerate, and, and to leave the land in better heart than that which we took it on. Uh, and I think now we have sort of more sort of a tangible tools to actually deliver on that, actually. Yeah. And so, so you, you speak about of being of good heart and many people will, will talk about health and I guess what I'm hearing in that answer is how connected uh, societal or, or individual health is to the health of the land and, and health of soil. There's something quite wonderful about how, uh, how much soil can remind us of that connection. Um, could, you, could you speak about, from your perspective, what health means for soil, what a healthy soil actually is? Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's one of these terms that's hard to define in the positive and and more easy to define or to um, um, imagine in the negative. So, for example, if you think about your own health, you know we all know when we're feeling under the weather. For example, we all know when we're like you know um, when we're feeling ill, unhealthy. If you like, if you like. Uh, it means that we're tired, it means we're sluggish, it means, for example, that we can't think very well, you know, we're below par, we're not 100%, basically. And, you know, when you're with your loved ones, for example, you know, their their thoughts are with you to sort of get back to, you know, sort of, you know, to recover and become, you know, fully healthy, for example, because uh, it allows you to function um, at your, you know, at 100% if you like and so it is with the land basically that you know when the land is sort of unhealthy you know it doesn't function as as it could basically um, so I guess you could kind of think about like almost think about the sort of like the elite athlete for example you know they perform at their top rate for example because of all the extra sort of effort and care and uh, research that's gone in um, to the sort of function of their body, basically. Uh, and again, so it is with the soil that, um, you know, we can either neglect it and or like ignore the signs um, of dysfunction, um, 
or we can uh, identify the the um, the evidence of, of function and try to sort of build on that and work towards that and use that as our sort of like um, yardstick compass horizon whatever you like yeah. I suppose it's similar to human health it's kind of obvious to say it's it's as much about uh, cure as it is about prevention as well and uh, it's maybe helpful to play with this human analogy that humans will need a good diet sufficient hydration sufficient movement time outside connection with others perhaps and necessary challenge as well to grow um, just to be more to speak more tangibly about when 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 you're looking at soil when you're doing your your monitoring and, and research what is it that you're looking for in that soil in terms of uh, it could be biology physics chemistry or something actually just a lot more qualitative um, yep yep um yeah well um simply i just look for one thing um actually to be honest uh, and that's aggregation uh, that's crumb structure um that is the one thing that I've found personally through my own uh, experiences of um, observing soils directly that correlates with the different soil health practices where we see more uh, diverse plantings, where we see soil that's undisturbed or covered, for example, or rested for longer periods, for example, if it's a grazing situation. We see crumb structure, we see aggregation, basically. Um, and that correlates with a whole host of sort of macro um, phenomena, uh, things like infiltration rate, things like um, uh, compaction, or sort of penetration, penetrometer, if you like, um, slate tests, aggregate stability, you know, these all kind of lead back to this sort of um, central kind of condition, um, if you like, of the soil and whether it has this sort of like loose kind of, kind of springy, fluffy, sort of open structure, basically. Um, effectively, you could say that like the more open space you have in your soil, the more healthy it is. Uh, and that can be expressed through proxy means like uh, infiltration rate tests, for example. Um, you know, with the exception of like very stony soils or very light soils, generally speaking, um, you know, with mineral soils where water percolates more rapidly, where it infiltrates quicker, um, you have more air space, you have more openings between uh, the soil particles, uh, which allows water to percolate through basically. And that means you don't have standing water in the middle of winter, for example, you have less poaching or you have less, basically less mud. Yeah, because uh, most of the time when we see kind of like, when we feel sort of slippy and greasy soils underneath our feet, for example, when mud sticking to the boots where, yeah, very, where it feels muddy and waterlogged, all these kind of situations. Most of the time, the water is just sitting on the surface. The fields are nowhere near at capacity um, because the water is just not infiltrating. It's, it's just running off. Uh, and that's basically why you get this sort of boom and bust. You go from sort of like, sort of wet, claggy, sort of um, winter conditions to like set concrete in just a few weeks, basically. Uh, and that's because the soil lacks aggregation. It lacks that crumb structure basically and i guess just for for some of the listeners um obviously for those who aren't driving at the moment if they could close their eyes and imagine what what it is we're we're looking at it, would you say it's fair to say that what we're aiming for with that crumb structure is something akin to a sponge as opposed to a, a brick um would be the opposite of that. yeah absolutely yeah so there's a few different baking analogies yeah you can think of like how bread is different to flour you pour water onto bread, what's it do? It, it, it soaks in, you can hold, this, hold the slice of bread, even like a crappy slice of white toast you can, or bread, you can hold it up in the air and the water doesn't yeah. run out, you know? You try to pour water onto, onto flour, it just all runs off, basically, and takes a bit of the flour with it, basically. Yeah. Um, or you can think of a baking analogy when you're making biscuits, for example. You start with that same base ingredients, sugar and flour, um, and that material in the bowl, you know, kind of sits, you know, occupies the full volume of that um, vessel, if you like. You add the binding agent, it sort of fluffs up. You know, when you take out your crumble, for example, you know, it has it now a very different mm -hmm. size and shape, you know, the crumble topping, as opposed to um, its sort of component parts. Um, so you go from what is otherwise known as a very homogeneous material, your flour particles, they're all the same shape and size as each other, as with 
uh, your sugar, for example. Uh, you had the binding agent, you had the fat, basically the butter, for example. Now they're very different yeah. in size. So you can go from just a couple of millimeters up to maybe sort of like 10, 12, like half an inch almost, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, so now we describe that material as being heterogeneous. Uh, and when it is in that state, the individual crumbs, as they're called, they no longer pack together in a tight sort of mesh. They're sort of pushed away from each other. Mm -hmm. um, so you have spaces between the material basically so you've reduced the density and that that space is a place for organisms to live it's a space for water to move through and it's a place for air to to be exchanged to and from yeah so so when we when we're thinking about soil it's actually really big we're shifting towards more thinking about the biology people talk about the engineers and other functions um, earthworms, various other microorganisms that are creating that crumb structure when in good health. Um, can you talk about what, are there any visual indications you might look for um, in terms of biology that someone can, anyone can do in the back garden or on the farm and go out and look at the soil, something that might show something to them? Yeah, well certainly in that instance, um, you know, earthworm counts um, are indicated. They're not universally um, representative you know you can get a big bloom of um, earthworm populations um, after a muck application and that's not to say that like muck applications aren't indicated they are um, but it's just if you want to sort of like get a representative um, kind of benchmark of earthworm populations you probably want to do that before doing a muck, muck application or that you just would want to try and identify the species of worm that you are sort of counting basically. So there's lots of red worms, for example, then they're obviously mostly gonna be sort of composting worms. Whereas what we're interested in more than sort of like gray, green, basically the kind of the soil dwellers, if you like. So obviously that, that that's one sort of macro um, indicator. And again, the main thing to understand here is that your macroorganisms feed on microorganisms. Everything feeds on something that's smaller than it. Than it. Um, and in the case of earthworms, you know, their, their favorite food is um, protozoa, sort of small predatory single-celled organisms, which they kind of like filter feed effectively like a sort of whale, if you like, by their sort of like hundreds of thousands. So they ingest, you know, a, a whole sort of like chain of soil, basically, kind of like a sausage of soil, and then digest out um, what what is digestible, and then excrete um, what is very fine um, sort of compost at the back end, basically, you know, they're doing their own manuring. So yes, you can certainly look at uh, sort of higher life, for example, as indicative of the presence or the population of the lower life, because they've got to be supported by um, the smaller microorganisms. Um, but otherwise, sort of, you know, microscopy tests are indicated, you know, you can learn to use a microscope and um, look for nematodes, for example, and look for protozoa. They are quite easy to spot actually, um, even with just fairly basic microscope training, um, uh, or else there are kind of like sort of handheld meters like the bi microbiometer, for example, which is just coming through at the moment. That seems interesting as well. Okay, great. Um, so w one of the things we're, we're doing together, and one reason we're doing the podcast today is um, also FarmEd and, and yourself are partnering to run a series of regenerative soil health courses, um, one for arable farmers, another for growers, horticultural growers, another for uh, livestock farmers and grazers. Um, I imagine a lot of what we're speaking today about these qualitative tests will come up in, in those courses. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what people can expect to, to get from those courses as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, the sort of foundation um, of each of the three pathways um, um, with relation to soil health is the soil health principles. So these are sort of seven kind of like pithy or kind of potted um, directives that help growers to select best practice or help growers and farmers to um, rank different management practices um, uh, in order of, of how sort of how they will promote how well they will promote uh, health in their systems, basically. Um, so I like to think of them effectively as a kind of ranking tool. So, you know, in any given situation, any given scenario, there may be like two or three different sort of options on the table for establishing a crop, for example, or doing a reseed. 
um, into pasture um, or when selecting species in cover crops for example you know um, and in that instance we basically put those sort of three options on the table and rank each of them against the soil health principles um, living root, covered soil, undisturbed soil, um, diversity, feeding soil um, and minimising the use of chemicals and synthetics basically. Um, so that's actually some of the processes we do on the course that give people sort of like example scenarios and um, get them to sort of uh, rank a set of kind of like uh, practices whether they be orthodox or novel um, and identify um, the kind of practices that they might want to be moving towards uh, when conditions allow basically sort of going forward so it's really about an analysis um, of existing practice um, and also understanding the, the concepts that underpin um, the different soil health principles um, and then the sort of like second and third days are really about um, then being able to implement um, those principles so for example in an arable context um, what we'll take is like a sort of you know some kind of map of existing practice you know and typically that would be like a crop rotation basically but in this instance we want it to be a complete um, kind of map so show every single intervention that's done for a particular crop not all of them but you know indicative crops so a root crop um, a cereal um, and a seed potentially you know within that um, and in that instance we want to sort of list out on the timeline every single um, primary and secondary intervention you know pre-treatments establishment starter fertilizers in crop treatments when they go on what material uh, in what means and what rates for example and from doing that we then basically have a list of points of intervention so for example with a, like a, um, a potato crop uh, that would almost certainly be like sort of monthly fungicide applications three or four um, um, uh, fertil fertilizer applications in the initial phase for example so each of these we can then identify okay so what materials are going down and why how can we substitute those materials to be either less harmful uh, or to be more efficient for example you know so we can use less of you know um, and then we go through a sort of like, like ideally a series of, sort of iterative analyses so identify what the weak points are using things like the sort of health principles how are we doing for cultivation how are we doing for covered soil during the establishment phase, for example, you know, how can we reduce that? How can we eliminate that? I mean, fundamentally, we're looking to like eliminate or substitute practices um, that are um, part of the orthodoxy um, and transition to sort of regenerative practices. Yeah, and uh, it's that I can really hear that that keyword transition at the end there. I think for some people, often they'll see a success farmer and think they need to do everything all at once, but actually, it's there is there is space for transitioning like you said substituting minimizing um and, and on that I'm, I'm kind of curious um what you think you, you mentioned about minimizing these these chemical or synthetic inputs what role do you think there is for um let's say ecological or biological inputs um are they necessary are they nice nice to have um i know you've done some work with with vermiculture for example um yeah so i guess that like uh, again, it's important to look at the whole and to make sure that your analysis is as complete as, as it can be. Um, so, you know, in this instance, we're trying to address causes. We're trying to treat causes, not symptoms, for example. So we're always asking or wanting or seeking to ask that why question uh, and to ask that why question deeply. You know, so if we're seeing weeds present, if we're seeing pests present in numbers, you know that's sufficient to actually cause an infestation we want to ask the question why are they there basically what are they telling us mm. about our broader management practices generally speaking um where pests are present certainly where they're present in multiple years for example that indicates to us that that's part of a systemic or it's um, a symptom of systemic management practices so step one is to identify why the pests coming in or well, typically it's because the plants are stressed the plants are weak the pests are picking up on that basically they see them as food and they home in they start to um, infest the plants basically and populations grow 
because there's a rich food source accessible to them basically. So fundamentally what we want to do is grow healthy plants. Healthy plants are, are less susceptible to pests and diseases, are less attractive to pests and diseases for example. So you know that's sort of step one basically and one of the interesting things is you know there's some you know some really quite good research coming out from the states now that shows that um, pest pressure, pest populations and pest presence amongst pesticide treated plants can be significantly higher um, than in regeneratively managed operations where they're not using pesticides. So the issue with the use of chemicals and synthetics, they're a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, I spray, therefore I have to spray basically. You create susceptibility in plant through the application of um, synthetics and chemicals and that's mostly by changing the plant physiology making them more palatable more digestible um, to organisms and therefore more attractive basically every pest every animal is able to seek out their food through their senses basically and they will leave aside foods that are not digestible they are not attractive they're not palatable they're not tasty you know the same thing that with with humans if a bunch of humans are standing around in a in a drafty barn, for example, listening to someone waffle on, like me, for example, someone brings in some hay bales, what are they all gonna do? Have a seat, mm -hmm. you know? If you did the same with a bunch of cows, they are definitely not gonna sit on them. They're gonna eat them, mm -hmm. because hay is cow food, for example, it is not human food. And so, so it is with and the plants we're growing. If we're growing plants that are attractive to aphids, for example, we are effectively growing aphid food. Yeah, a healthy plant is indigestible to an aphid. Yeah, um, so we definitely want to seek uh, ways to uh, reduce um, the use of these kind of products on the understanding that they basically induce the need for their use. Yep, uh, the more you apply fungicides, effectively, the more susceptible plants become to fun fungi. And that makes a lot of sense, both above ground and, and below ground, the, the more in effect we're simplifying these systems, um, the easier it is for dominant species to sink in, which otherwise might be kind of kept in balance by that natural ecology of the system there. Um, so it certainly requires more knowledge, and I think this is why the, the likes of your work and the course we're, we're going to be running here will really help people transition along that knowledge pathway, because um, it's very different, as you say, very different to ask what's going on as opposed to why. It's a much deeper learning process there. Um, and uh, one thing with those courses is it, so it's a, essentially two sessions. There'll be uh, the first day will all be about the fundamentals and the principles and also getting to understand how to check the soil um, using some of these qualitative and very easy to use tests, um, followed by a few weeks later, a two day block where we'll go into the application of those ideas to farms um, in between there's some homework that, that people will be asked to do. Can you speak to speak to that? Yep, yeah. Um, so the idea with uh, with this this approach across the board, whether it's me or other practitioners sort of offering it, is that we want you to, um, you the farmer, you the student, you the kind of listener, if you like, to go out and to observe your land, basically. I think that the sort of the fundamental, the, the key, to achieving um, the sort of regenerative outcomes is the ability to be able to read read your land and to understand what it's telling you basically um, and I think the kind of the, um, the fundamental sort of assumption here is that the only person that can know your land um, well or as well as you is you basically you're the only one that can really ever know your land in any sort of depth you know the experts and trainers that can give you general information, give you general advice, for example, but they can never know the nuance, the detail, the subtlety of your land. So um, what we encourage uh, practitioners to do is to find new ways um, to observe and to monitor, basically, you know, sort of kind of like, you know, monitoring data gathering is a bit of a buzzword, if you like. Um, and it can seem like a bit of a sort of daunting task if you oh, I should be out there doing earthworm tests, I should be out there doing dot, dot, dot. Um, but I think, you know, what's important is to understand that, like, you know, sort of monitoring 
an observation is just looking you know it's just taking 30 seconds or a minute you know when you come into a field for example and you're going to do some cultivation work or whatever you're going to do you know just get the spade out for example just look at the soil for a second smell the soil take a photograph you know and and um, start to get into the habit of just looking basically um, and you know within the context of the course um, and my work actually as um, um, as a consultant is to use the Soil Mentor app, um, which is an app that I helped to, to design um, with Abby Rose and her team. Um, and we use that as a way to be able to um, gather data, um, both quantitative and qualitative, take photographs, GPS locate, um, different um, sort of observations and then um, to be able to upload those to a kind of a central sort of account for the course basically and we can then feed back on it. So it's a sort of like a two-way um, sort of process. You know, you're able to sort of gather data and uh, present it in a way that's easily accessible to yourself and to me and then I'm able to feed back and other people are able to sort of like interact with um, your kind of like monitoring and data gathering work uh, and part of the sort of initial phase is to try and get you sort of up and running so that you're taking sort of the right data or good data um, that will sort of be useful going forward, basically. Um, so there's two sort of aspects to it. One is sort of getting into the habit of doing it and helping you to sort of like, you know, sort of um, to, to develop those habits. And the other one then is to, to, um, to learn to take good data, to take repeatable data like um, consistent um, observations, photographs, tests, etc. Um, and it's that consistency that means you can then look back and, and start to observe or interpret the trends that might be coming through, basically. And I think that's a sort of key word that is really, we we're looking for sort of upward trends, you know, around diversity, for example, earthworm numbers, infiltration rates, aggregation, etc. We should be seeing sort of steady rises on most of those um, fronts basically and the use of the app is a, a way for you to or the potential for you to be able to track that and identify whether you're you know improving or uh, or not basically Brilliant. and I think it's really important to to reflect again on these the types of tests here for anyone who's not so nostalgic of school when I say homework it's kind of an opportunity to go out and I love how Vita Cycle mentioned you can you can just do this while walking the dog um, they're very quick and easy tests and it's a real shift away from this reliance on lab testing which for certain things particularly soil carbon are just so unreliable and we're still not quite there yet um, and so this is the not only the best we have in some cases it's also something people can do immediately themselves without spending more money um, and kind of take back some of that agency as well um, we've got a little bit of time left um, so I just wanted to also just touch on agroforestry, which um, there's been 101 webinars on it in the last year during lockdown. Um, it's an ancient practice, but it's gaining momentum in the UK. Um, and we've been working together on, on some of the designs for this um, living textbook that we're developing here, the idea of multiple agroforestry systems at FarmEd to demonstrate the theory and principles behind agroforestry. Um, and I just wanted to get briefly your thoughts on linking it into soil again why am I integrating trees on farms be beneficial for soil hmm yeah okay so what well, you've got above ground and below ground interactions there basically um, and if we're thinking about soil specifically um, we see like measurable improvements in infiltration where trees are present um, and when compared to sort of orthodox um, grazed pasture for example that can often be sort of 10 times improvements you know so you know order of magnitude of step change for example um, and you know we're also seeing sort of like changes in the sort of soil structure basically so there's good examples from the island for example sort of like where trees are present or where they have been planted uh, the rushes have disappeared you know so they're like you know a few meters away from rush infested field um, where the trees are growing, um, there's basically just like grasses now dominate, 
you know, even though they're sort of they're, they're sort of in some shade in inverted commas, if you like. Um, so what we're really doing, or what the sort of like um, the the assumption here is that we're changing the below ground community and we're shifting it towards more fungally dominated communities and that's where the the macro aggregates come from it's the fungi that produce the aggregates the crumbs that you can actually see with your own eyes basically um, so we're getting we're getting a more functional soil basically soils that favor trees and grasses as opposed to soils that favor rushes and um, creeping buttercup for example fog etc you know all these sort of like weedy species for example you know um, um, we can see or should see a decline in them basically brilliant and and of course that's not to also mention all the added benefits potentially for livestock and for crops and, and what have you and, and the landscape at large um, which we could go on for a whole other hour I'm sure talking about that um, but we, we also have uh, I mean we're, we're going to be doing a fair bit of work together this year um, so for anyone interested in attending the Oxford Real Farming Conference in the field um, you're, you're going to be doing some workshops on soil testing uh, some of the stuff we've spoken about also give um, a, a talk about uh, agroforestry and some of the work we're doing here at Farm Ed. We've got the soil course that we've mentioned or three of those uh, which people can look up on the website um, they'll be running between September and November um, and then finally, we, we have this agroforestry and design masterclass. Um, and this is something we, we've been working on together to address the, the knowledge gap in the UK. There are limited examples, you, you could say, of, of, um, of mature agroforestry systems working successfully. Um, although one could argue we have infinite, well not infinite, but a very large number of, of hedgerows. And that's a great starting point um, for many people. Um, so that's something also people could could be looking forward to if they want to get started on agroforestry. Um, it would be a great place to, to come and, and figure out their designs and get an action plan. Um, and maybe there's something you want to add on what to expect from that course. Yeah, I guess it's like um, in this instance we're looking to um, um, yeah attract those that are sort of a, a bit sort of further down the line, people that are kind of ready to sort of take it to the next stage, if you like. Um, but they're not sure, you know, about some of the sort of nitty gritty about which species to choose, how to mix different species in in the row, for example, um, and you know what would be sort of like best practice for establishment, for example. Um, you know, can are there mechanised means for planting trees, for example, and in, and in which case, you know, is that suitable for bare root trees or cell grown trees? You know, these different sort of like um, um, stock types, if you like, that come from the nurseries. Um, so all of that we can help with, basically. You know, so the idea is that you'll come away with, you know, if if you're keen, um, a finished design, um, tree-based design uh, for your whole farm, or at least you know a number of fields, for example, um, with a bill of materials, so a species list, and you know a tree count, for example. So pretty much everything that you need to go away to the nursery and say I want this number of this and that number of that for example and you know and to know which contractors you want to sort of bring in or what machinery you're going to bring in basically to establish and then maintain um, your new plantings basically um, so yeah try and make it a bit of a one-stop shop basically brilliant so yeah that, that's going to be on the 8th and 9th of September at Farm Ed um, it will be your, yourself uh, Ben Raskin and Tyrion uh, Keatinge as well so we've got three people coming there'll be lots of opportunity for one-to-one -one clinics and group design work as well um, so I've definitely run over the, the time we planned but it's been a really exciting and informative conversation so I'm very grateful um, just for listeners to be able to get in touch and you've got lots of online courses and your coaching work going on as well um, do you want to just share where they can get hold of you yeah just um, main point of contact is through my website nilscorefield.com um, or otherwise kind of like social media channels, um, Nils underscore Caulfield at Twitter, for example. Brilliant. So we'll, we'll add them in, in a, a link that goes out with, with this podcast so people can get in touch as well. Um, and also a link to all of the events that we're running with Nils uh, this year at Farm Ed. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. I'm thank excited you. to go and look at some soil later. Me too. <laughs>